I'm a young black man Doing all that I can To stay Oh, but when I look around And I see what's being done Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Bishop Jay. Uh, welcome to our Tab Talk Tuesdays. We are uh, in the midst of uh, literally uh, social uprising protests going on around the country. And uh, we felt like it. this is a great moment, a great time for us to uh, have some conversations uh, with some Black men uh, who are leaders in our church uh, concerning how uh, the death of George Floyd and uh, really all of the other deaths that have occurred uh, within our culture uh, via police brutality, uh, racism, uh, to really just have a conversation and let you all hear the heart uh, of people in our TAP community and ultimately everyone who's tuning in today. Uh, so I, we wanted to take a moment and uh, invite you into our space just for a little while. Uh, and uh, I wanna bring on our panel today uh, who are joining me in the persons of uh, Twy Jackson, uh, Roe Barnett, and Charles Fleming. They're all leaders and pastors in our um, at, at the TAP, um, and uh, they carry weight with regard to their voices in my life personally and um, how we lead the church corporately. Uh, so, hey guys, what's going on? Glad you all are joining in with us today. Um, I don't know how much of the intro y'all heard uh, being behind the scenes, but uh, this is y'all, as you all know, this is a really a conversation that we're having uh, concerning kind of our state of mind, where we are right now, how we feel, how um, what's happening in Minneapolis and ultimately what has um, the, the fire started in Minneapolis and it spread literally throughout the country. Um, so I wanted to uh, have some conversations uh, around where we are and, and how things have progressed. Um, do ha Have we made progress is uh, what is happening with the, the protests. They're, ha they're happening here in Baltimore, DC, Atlanta, Seattle, Washington, uh, Minneapolis, LA, New York, um, Jersey, uh, several cities in New Jersey, Philadelphia, um, just, and that's just to name a few. Um, where where do we stand? How has this, well, let me rephrase. What made this particular incident, because there have been hundreds, if not thousands of deaths in the last few years um, of black men, black women at the hands of police and as a result of racism. Um, what made this different? Anybody can jump in. <laughs> uh, I, I'll give it. I'll give it to Twa. Um. So I, I think what made this particular one different is it, it seemed to isolate all the variables, right? I mean, here you have uh, an unarmed black man. He wasn't resisting. Um, he's here. He's lying face down. Um, particularly of interest was the fact that there was a crowd there um, and, and they point to the numerous signs, which would suggest that this, this, this can't be accidental. I think for far too often, we've always heard some sort of um, behind the scenes, oh, well, there's this variable that we couldn't account for. So that somehow excuses it or lets it off the hook. This time, there were a bunch of people. They were there. They told you that the man couldn't breathe. It's not like you didn't know. Um, he was in cuffs. He was laying face down on the ground. He had a knee on the back of his neck, which is not only in, in, um, 
incorrect police tactics. But I mean, it's just, it's inhumane. And to hear people tell you that you were literally killing this man and you keep it there for another additional four minutes after the fact, I think is what really, really resonates with people because it's like, well, you know what? I've heard all the reasons and all the rationales, you know, when the Eric Garner cases and in the cases of the past as to why this might be, why, you know, the, the legitimate or, you know, whatever reason as to why this was, you know, charges weren't filed or people weren't convicted of murder. This is pretty open and shut. It, it's murder. There's no other way to put it. There's no other way to classify it. You murdered the man in, in broad daylight in front of everybody and did it with the no emotion. Just walked away, got back in your car and went about your life. Agreed. Uh, I agree 100%. Go ahead, was, Oh, my bad. For me, it was um, actually watching the death. It wasn't a gunshot where it's kind of, it's, it's, it's not immediate, but it's quick. But to watch the life actually leave out of a human being was um, I, I, mind blowing is the incorrect word, but um, it enraged me. And of course it was all, it was on all social media outlets on, on the news. So the whole world was watching death occur. And I think that's what, what hit the hardest. A gunshot, okay, I see that he hit, I, I saw that he got hit by a bullet. I saw that he fell. But to actually see his face and see life, him transition from life to death was just um, earth shattering for me. I also think that one of the, the propellants, if you will, is the, the, the environment in which this happened. Um, the fact that for weeks, months, Everybody had been already at a stressful point. And the fact there were uh, differences in how this virus was impacting our, our own black skins, if you will. And you had a lot of people that were already stressed. So the fact that it was already in an environment where there were some racial tensions, albeit not caused by uh, other humans, all that was a perfect storm, if you will, for for all the reasons you guys said, plus we were already on an edge, already dealing with stuff already. Um, that's, I think, is a propellant that really took this thing over. Because I often think if ever, if if COVID, would have we had the outpouring, and maybe we would have, had we not been in the COVID-19 predicament that we're, you know, people were home. People have nothing to do but watch TV. People sit there in front of CNN, in front of all the, so they can consume it over and over without quote unquote disruption from everyday life. So that I think also had a point in why it's different. You, you know, to, to that point, Ro, I, oh. no, go ahead, to, that point, to that point though, one, one of the things is that, you know what, you don't have an excuse for not seeing it. You know what I mean? It's not just that we are seeing it and being enraged, but it is everybody's home, you know, from the That's rich right. to the poor, you know, white, black, and every other color in between, everybody's seeing this. So now you tell me that you can't tell me that you, you're too busy to take a stand. You can't tell me that you didn't have time to watch. You can't tell me that you had other things on your plate. You don't. You're home with COVID just like everybody else. You saw it now. What is your what is your what is your response? What is what is it that you're gonna right. say? And literally is taking right. away the excuse from everybody. And I think to I think to add to the angst that we were already dealing with um, the reality of the Ahmad Aubrey death and how that impacted us because we we were on edge. First off, he died in February, and um, the, the, his death didn't get the kind of attention it should have in February. But when that when the video of that death that murder leaked. And we were able to see uh, really how depraved a heart could be to chase a man, um, literally hunt him down. That's really what they did. Um, they, they hunted Ahmad Aubrey down um, over the course of four minutes. They have video proof to, to show that over the course of four minutes, they hunted this man down, um, set up a blockade and killed him because they didn't like the fact that a black man um, had gone into a property 
that we now know multiple other people had gone on to and nothing happened to the, all of those people because they were white. Um, I think we were at a fever pitch when Ahmaud Aubrey died and to see not just another black man, but another black man die a slow death. I think that was the straw that broke the camel proverbial back. And it was like, are you kidding me? I, we're, we're still dealing with this. And um, on top of the fact that the cop looked at the camera with basically dead eyes, he was completely apathetic to what he was doing. And, and again, he didn't, it, it's not like he didn't know what was occurring. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew it. They told him, he's, even some of the other cops are like, hey man, don't you think you let him up? When the paramedics arrived, he still had his knee on this man's neck. He wanted to kill him. And I think it was us not just believing that there were there are um, cops who want to decimate the black community, but knowing for a fact that his intention was to take this man's life. And he believed, I believe he believed in his heart. Ain't nothing gonna happen to me, I'm a cop. He's a black man, it, this happens all the time. And knowing later on that he's been cited 18 different times and he was still on the street, says a whole lot about the system and how as black people, we're not dealing with just racist or racist cops, we're dealing with a, a system that is racist, systemic racism that gives permission to people to feel like they can treat us as second-class citizens, uh, even though we operate in the same spheres as they. Yeah, I mean, you look at how we uh, even got here. I mean, you look at how we got here. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that this, that George Floyd was looked at to be, I think the, 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 the call that went out was a fourth process. It was him essentially passing a bad check, which we later come to find out he has sufficient, you know, reports are he has sufficient funds in his account. So it wasn't even a bad check, but you know, like he's in cuffs for- Well, it turned out it was a potential counterfeit $20 bill. That's actually what it turned out to be, which is even worse to me. Which is even worse. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we like the, the, <laughs> the, the mass criminalization of African-American actions, right? Like, it's like, you know, are we having the same conversation if George Floyd isn't an African-American male, right? I mean, yeah. if, he, if he's a white female, are you putting him in cuffs in the first place to take him out of the car? I all. mean, and the fact that, I mean, to your point, you said it's a tw counterfeit $20 bill. Does anybody think that George Floyd got a printing press at his home that he's making counterfeit $20? <laughs> no, not at all. Like, if he's got a counterfeit $20 bill, it's because he got it from a transaction like any of us could have gotten a counterfeit $20 bill. I mean, it's clearly not and intentional. That is the piece that I think makes me most angry because it'd be different if he handed you 20 fake $20 bills. If he handed you a single $20 bill that potentially is, is fraudulent or counterfeit, what makes you think the right frame of action is to call the cops because of a single $20 bill that might be counterfeit? And, and to me, that that is the system at work that says, like you said, the general criminalization of African American men, especially, that if if he has something that's counterfeit, then he is a criminal. I don't care how you slice the pie, he's a criminal and he needs to go to jail, even if he has done absolutely nothing wrong. And for this man to be taken out of his car, handcuffed, not resist then put in the back of a police car. I saw another video where he's in the back of the police car where he, they're beating him while he's in the back of a police car with one of the cops standing watch. This is a system that we're dealing with, not just, you know, just some isolated bad cops. There is a system that is being employed that we are protesting against, that the riots are all about. And I, I think that part of the issue where, where we are right now is, um, how do we how do we carry ourselves in public when the least and most innocuous of our acts can be considered can be considered dangerous and an impetus to death? Breonna Taylor was sweet. 
um, mm -hmm. a Tati, a Tatiana Jefferson was playing video games in her house. Neither one of those people were doing anything. Amon Aubrey was going for a jog. Where are we safe? One, one thing that it, it's one thing when you say your ex, which, you know, we got to be very careful. It's not only our ex, it's our dress. Uh, 18 months ago or so, when I went to a store, um, I had on a hoodie and I had pockets that you know, on the hoodie that the, the front of the pockets, I carry my keys, I carry two phones, I carry my wallet. So it was bulged out. I went to check out and the a white um, manager stopped me because she thought I was stealing because I had a bulge on the front of my hoodie. And she reached her hand into my pocket and pulled it back to look at just because of what I had on. Now we happened to be at consecration. We were in conference, this is January, and we were already on edge. I was already on edge. And, and you were hungry, I brother. So, I was hungry. I was hungry. Um, the, the bottom line is that I came from the deep south and it, I had to come all the way up to Maryland to really experience that blatant, that level of racism. Just because I'm a black man who is wearing a hoodie, it's bulging, and I was incensed. Uh, it, it's probably the, the most demanding. So to answer your question, I don't know. I, I have to watch what I wear in certain circumstances, much less watch what I do, because I'll be perceived as a threat, as a stalker, as, a, as a, someone who is all out to not only impact my somebody else, but it impact my environment. So it's already assumed that I don't have a a a piece of the pie. So I'm gonna, you know, burn the pie, if you will, or kick the pie off. Since I'm dis I it's assumed I'm already disenfran disenfranchised. And it's assumed I'm a threat because I'm trying to uh, create anarchy because I don't have a seat at the table just because I'm a black man. But you also happen to be a big black man as well. You know, yeah, you're, yeah. you're three six four. There. So that 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 only exacerbates how you're perceived. So you're 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 six three with a hoodie on with a bulge in the front. Oh, you got to be a thief, and that is as ridiculous as they come. That that's a it's it's a, a really dumb philosophy to live under. I mean, I'm not six feet. Three. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm nine, six feet, so I claim it in the name of Jesus. Um, and um, <laughs> I'm called, you know, the, people think I'm a football player because of my bill. Um, and it happens all the time. And so I can be doing something that's, again, something that's completely innocuous. And I'm looked at as a big black guy. And it's one of the unfortunate realities that we have to deal with. We have to find a way to look innocent as it were threatening you know not yeah not threatening innocent um oh uh, he's he's good he's cool we have to find ways to, to water down how we're perceived See, we have to be perceived as friendly as possible in all of our interactions simply because we're black men and that by no means is fair but if we want to get home to our wives and children, if we want to get home to our families, well, I mean, twice, you're not, not yet wives and children, um, but for, for the, you know, for the, for the other three of us, uh, if we want to get home to our wives and, and kids, we have to present ourselves as friendly as possible. If Twa wants to get home to, to his safety net, he has to present himself as polite, as uh, disciplined, and as friendly as possible, simply because we're black guys. And I, to me, that's the, I think that's part of the issue is that we the one thing that we can't do is change how we look. We can't change the color of our of our skin. We can't change, you know, uh, how we're perceived. Just when somebody comes in a room and go, oh, oh here, here we go. Here's a black guy. We can't change that. And it, it, it's the, the common thread that every black man in America has to deal with. And you know, it's one of the things that you that you said. You know, we're talking about you know acts and then taking it to our to our clothes. But I mean, honestly, fact of the matter is, as a black man, you can't afford to have a bad day, right? 
You can't have a day where you go out and you're on edge and you go off because that day is the day that you're kind of risking it all. I mean, we know we've, we've been living with these sort of understandings of what we must do to sort of kind of fit the societal norm. You know, there's certain things you can't wear. I mean, everybody else can wear it, but you can't wear it. I mean, they say it's casual Friday at work, but you know you can't go, but so casual. You know you can't dress, but a certain kind of way. You know you can't wear, you know, certain types of things. Um, I mean, you, you you have to make sure that you smile. I mean, I think generally speaking, I, I know when I'm walking through the hallways, whether, you know, it's at work or, or some place of business, if I don't smile, nobody's going to speak to me. They're going to immediately see me as threatening, as menacing. And I mean, I, you don't know me. I haven't done anything to you, but unless I smile and say, how you doing? Good morning. I got to go out of my way to do all of those things just so you can feel safe, so you can feel okay, so you can feel all right. And it's like, <clears throat> when you look at kind of what's going on in the world today, that's a lot of stress every day to put on that face. You know, um, um, I don't know if it's Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Langston Hughes has a, has a poem talking about we wear a mask. Every day I got to put on this mask to look appropriate for you so that you feel safe about me. When in reality, mm. if we play back the tape, who's been harming who, right? I mean, you know, if anybody should be concerned about their, their, their safety and fearful of somebody else, it shouldn't be the black man. We don't, we don't make bullets. Exactly. We don't make guns. We don't. Right. Per capita, we're not the ones who own firearms for the most part. If you want to, if you want to be honest about that, we're not the we're not per capita. We're not the ones who own firearms. Per capita, we're not the ones who who will storm uh, city halls armed to the teeth like militiamen. That that doesn't happen in the black community. You know, Ch Chuck, what what does how do you what is how has this made you feel? What what has been um, the emotional response for you in in this space. Um, I said I said this before um, on another another opportunity I had to speak. Um, it's frustration and frustration in two ways. Frustration that it's continuing to happen, but the other frustration was the frustration with myself. And what I mean by that is. Um, I have not had until, um, until this happened, this recent death of George Floyd, I've not had this conversation with the young man from the church. Mm. So I had to check myself like, okay, Chuck, you're upset, but you've not even had this conversation with the young men of the church, the, the next generation. You see these young men every Sunday, you ask them how school's going and that's it. You don't talk, you don't, you don't have deep conversations to see how they're feeling, um, what they're dealing with in school. Um, we've been blessed um, with, with our church to have um, middle class and upper class um, members. So our children tend to attend predominantly white schools. And with that said, I'm sure they're experiencing some level of racism. But I've not had these conversations with them. So for me, it was frustration with myself that I've gone so long without sitting down and checking in on these young men to see what effect this is having on them. I understand as, as, a, as a Black man, as a Black father, I've grown accustomed to code switching. I mean, that's just what, what we do. We just turn it on when we go to work, turn it off. I have sure that I code switch but um, do it in a manner where I don't um, trip the circuit or, or just go haywire at work. So for me, it's I've mastered it, but am I having these conversations with our, our future to ensure that they're growing up in a healthy space and they're not just holding things in because that, that's what we've done in the past. We are, I, I got to be met. I got. I have to be macho. I have to be a man. I'm gonna hold it in. My frustrations, uh, certain environments, I can't speak out, so I'm gonna just hold it in. But um, that's because we didn't have the opportunity to really speak our piece and get in touch with our emotions. So for me, it was frustration that we're continuing to see it. But on the flip side, I had to do uh, internal 
evaluation or inspection and say, okay, you can be frustrated, but you have not done what you could do in order to um, assist in getting this conversation out. So that's, that's what it was for me. So how do you fight against the whole angry black man narrative? Yeah, I, I had a conversation. This Let me just, I, I will be a little bit transparent today. I had a conversation, um, somebody called me today and um, we, we talked a little bit about the message on Sunday. And then they said, now you gotta be careful though, because um, you, you don't want to be perceived as angry. And um, you know, it's, it's some of the posts that I made were very pointed um, over the last couple of days. More so than I'm, I'm no, that's, that's my normal uh, mechanism. And I had to take it and I said, you know what, you're right. Um, because the truth is, my reality is I am angry. I, I, and the, the anger is we are not properly represented. Um, there's an image of black men um, that is being perpetuated um, the counter narrative that we hear on a regular basis of well, what about black on black crime and, and all of that. And people without, and, and here, here's a crazy, the crazy thing is, if you look, look at the statistics, there is more white on white crime than black on black crime. But black on black crime becomes the major part of the narrative because th th we, we, have a, we have the nerve to complain about racists killing us and cops killing us um, who are by and large of a different ethnicity than us. Then we have the nerve to complain about that. What about y'all killing each other? What about Chicago? And without understanding that Chicago is kind of an isolated situation. Um, and then there are certain other cities that have um, elevated black and black crime, but that's not the norm across the entirety of the United States. And for me, it's, I'm angry that we still have to fight to be recognized as valuable. I'm angry that um, at this point in my life, at 45 years old, uh, it's wrong for me to have a bad day. That at, at 45 years old, that even if, I mean, my life could be in shambles, but when I'm around other people who can perceive me as a threat, I have to dumb down myself. I have to shut off my emotions. We've, we've, we've been trained like Chuck just alluded to, we've been trained to live as if we have no emotions. And the problem is when you start to, to, to keep all of that stuff back, hold it in, hold it in, hold it in, hold it in, at some point, there is gonna be an explosion. And if you explode in the wrong environment, that we call on the cops, you know, look at this, you just, uh, you're, you're an angry black man. But in reality, we have much to be angry about. Um, Ro, how do you handle your anger? Or it, are you angry? It, has this made you angry? And if so, how do you handle it? And if you're not angry, how do you not get angry? Um, my feeling, there, there is a lot of frustration, uh, anger, frustration, you know, the, I, I don't know how you, you know, interpret between the two. But really, my, my biggest feeling that I had was a feeling of being an endangered species. Now, what do I mean by that? So mentally, we, I could process that because your, your question is what do you feel versus what you think? Mentally, I understood that we were endangered. I understood that, that I, I had the mental picture, but there were not a lot of feelings until this incident for me. I mean, uh, I really feel threatened now. I, I really feel like potentially if I'm not on my A game, quote unquote, being the com the compliant um, African American in, in all situations, that I may not make it back home. Um, and that, like we've all stated, that is that that shouldn't how that shouldn't be that way. How do I deal with it? Um, one of the thing you have to realize first of all, recognize that being angry is not a sin. Bible says, you know, Indeed. you know, anger and don't sin. So there's nothing wrong with me. Be, but how do I process that anger? What are the outlets that allow me to make this situation at least begin the process to to, to better outcomes? And in doing that, this is one of those outlets. Right now, this whole uh, broadcast is one that helps us 
outlet, let release some of that 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 pent up anger. Um, and like you, Chuck, I, I have to admit, I'm like, I'm not, you know, I got two young black males and I talk to them about it, but I haven't been as active, two sons, in really explaining them because I literally had to call them, hey, because, you know, they live in and around the White House near D.C. and area. And I'll say, hey, guys, don't go out there. And if you do, make sure you behave in a way that you're not carted, carted off to, to jail. You know, I don't want to see you on CNN doing some things that uh, could ultimately get you killed. So um, how I process it is really trying to understand what, how can I channel this energy in ways that is a positive net gain? Because some people, some people think, and, and the, the argument between, the tension between having a peaceful uh, um, rally with absolutely no violence, and let's just be truthful, is that going to move the needle like a rally which has some violence. And I'm not condoning violence, but there's a tension yeah. there. Okay, if we go out there and just sing kumbaya and raise our hand and then go home, is that really going to convey the type of anger that, that cause, cause that's what, if you really in positive ways, that makes it at a, on a, in a twisted way, well, you're not that angry. So that's one of the things I'm dealing with. I, I, on one side of my brain, I said they shouldn't tear up the neighborhood. And I'm going to be quite frank and quite honest. On the other side, it's like, well, now that they tore up the neighborhood, somebody might take it seriously. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, the notion of, I mean, one of the things that I really struggle with in all of this is this notion of the angry black man. And who said, I can't be angry because I'm a black man? Right. I mean, the the, yeah. the 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 layers that add to that. I mean, the fact that you're angry, but you can never you can never release it. You can never pour it out. I mean, what is that doing but making us um, hold toxicity inside? Right. I mean, it's making us mentally um, um, it's, it's challenging our mental health because we're walking around being angry with no proper outlet. I mean, we look at so many instances where we're like. I'm 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 angry, but I can't be angry. I mean, I remember my dad talking to me when I went to college and he was like, you know, my dad ran me through because he was like, look, I don't want to hear no stories of you fighting when you at school. I went to a predominantly white school. I don't want to hear no stories of you fighting at school. So my dad ran me through a bunch of scenarios. What do you do if they call you the N-word? And I was like, well, I, and he was like, no, you don't. You, I'm paying for this education. You can make sure you get your education. Um, and so it's mm -hmm. like constantly checking and tapping down that anger I mean, we 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 were taught, you know, say yes to the police officer, say okay, go get your lawyer later, right? It's everything about I cannot, I cannot express my anger because, and and I mean, I said this to somebody um, the other day. Part of it is, as a black man, I don't know what my anger looks like. I I, I can't tell you the last time I was able to just be angry without with reckless abandon. Mm -hmm. I'm not able to be angry. Because the moment That's I start very, feeling angry, I got to tap it down. I got to say, wait, calm down, Twa, because, you know, the society can't handle you when you're angry. So I don't get to, 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 to let go of whatever anger I have. And so I think a lot of what you're seeing in the riots is they don't know if that's riot, if that's anger from George Floyd, Ahmed Aubrey, or their own personal instance that they had two weeks ago, that's three good. years ago. That's the yeah. riots or Trayvon Martin. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Uh, or, or they're mad about institutional things. I mean, we can't act like that. This racism is just because uh, a police puts his puts his uh, knee on 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 a man's neck. There's institutional constructs. Why is it that we're all jammed up in certain neighborhoods? Why is it that we're denied economic opportunities? Why is it that we're denied? I mean, you think coronavirus is spreading and having uh, negative effects among African Americans is just oh, a coincidence? I think not. Um, I mean, some of these things are because of um, institutional and environmental factors. And so there's a lot of stress that as a black man, and I mean, and I, I understand that, that black women, they, they definitely have a plight. They have, they have struggles of their own, but as a black man, we wear it differently because nobody ever wants to hear our anger. Nobody ever can take that anger. I mean, it's just, it's like walking around. I equate it to, if you put a cup of water in a microwave and you, and you heat it up, 
that that cup of water looks still. Nothing is happening there. But then you add something to it, and it starts bubbling and boiling all over. We're that we're that cup. You're walking around and you're looking at us. You're thinking that everything is fine, and we're just one instance away from a powder keg uh, uh, moment. And we don't even know what, what we're capable of when we're angry. Mm, hydrate. That's so, that's so good. One hundred percent. And and when you when you frame it like that, I think that gives voice to how some of the protests have turned into riots and how the riots have escalated into looting. Um, and, and, and here's the other thing, they people take this ahistorical perspective that black people are the only ones who loot, black people are the only ones who riot. Um, and I think that is such an unfair perspective when, you know, when we see in New England, when a football, a hockey team or whatever won, won the, and, and the baseball team won, that the white constituency rioted. They turned over cars. They, they um, destroyed property. And it was, oh, these white men are just expressing their joy, their exuberance, or they're just angry. You know what I mean? They, they, they're just expressing themselves. So it's, it's again, we, we're going back to this institutionalized understanding for hundreds of years, any vestige of uh, anxiety or uh, in, in any time we express ourselves in a way that's demonstrative, it's been demonized. When on the other side of the coin, anytime they express themselves, it says these are just fine people. They're, they're just, you know, having a bad day. Uh, again, in, in Michigan, when you had militia show up to the capital of Michigan and threaten to kill Governor Whitmer, Trump de decided to call them good people. But when you have rioters, who are actually riding for something that is actually legitimate, not a haircut, not I'm tired of being inside. And, and, what, what, and to me, what made Michigan so bad is everybody is dealing with the exact same scenario. We're all at home. We all want to go out. I travel for a living. I've been home for half a year. That hasn't happened for me in over a decade, 12, 13 years for me to be home straight for half a year. My income is cut. Um, uh, my, even traveling for me is, is cathartic to some degree. Those things are taken away. I'm not going and busting out, busting out windows and, and, and going down to Annapolis saying, free us. That's not what I'm saying because I recognize that everybody is in the same boat. But when you're being demonized because you're expressing your ire, you know, for something that is blatantly unjust. But when the other side does it, it's, oh, they're good people. We're thugs. They're good people. That that narrative, and, and I think because we're fighting it from not just in our local communities, we're fighting it from a, from a nationwide system that agrees with philosophies that are absolutely untrue, narratives that are absolutely untrue. And now we're, we're forced to, to try to live down or, or live beyond a perception that was illegitimate when we showed up in the first place. So I, and, and mm. let me be honest, and give me your opinion about this. I ain't mad that the looting is happening. I'm not mad that the rioting is happening. I'm sorry that there's some businesses that are being negatively impacted. I pray that they have insurance. And if you have insurance, the insurance is going to make up the difference. I, be I believe that. But I'm not mad because part of what, here's the thing. Um, when, when, they, when white people burned Black Wall Street, there was mm -hmm. no reprisal for that. Millionaires in the 20s, 1920s, black millionaires lost all of their income, all their money, all of their property because white people could not stand the fact that there were upwardly mobile Negroes, and I'm trying not to use other term, upwardly mobile Negroes. So they burned Black Wall Street. They looted, they burned, they destroyed property. Nobody brings that up. But here it is. When we operate like they do, we're criminals, we're thugs. And, and so where do you all stand on it? And again, I don't want anybody to get killed. I don't want anybody to lose their property. I'm just simply saying, looting has been a part of our history for years. Go to any museum 
And what you're going to find is products that are on display that were taken from cultures, not given to them that were taken from culture. So we, when you go to a museum and you see, you know, a, a picture or, or a, you know, something that was made from a creative mind a hundred years ago, they didn't volunteer that. It was taken away. So are we not really perpetuating a cycle that was that was started by them? Here, here's uh, what I will tell you, looting. The, the, the looting, unfortunately, um, it, it's a twofold. It's like a two, two uh, I, I think that it puts an edge on the movement that otherwise wouldn't allow it to reach the, the visibility, but it also gives fodder for those who think we're animals, those who think that it gives more I fodder. It, it is at both times, I think, puts the edge on the on the argument and the movement, but at the same time provides more evidence, if you will, for the perceptions that are pervasive throughout society about us. So it's like, okay, yeah, it, it's got some arguably good impact in terms of, of, of the raising our voices, but it also, you know, they talk about the writing or, or is the language, you know, is a voice yeah. of people who haven't been heard. But at the same point, mm -hmm. it, it it provides the, the argument for those who put us in this predicament in the first place. Because unfortunately, I don't care how good we do or how uh, restrained we are, those culturally embedded perceptions of the black man are not going to be changed overnight. So any argument, they are only listening. They are only tuned in for the negative response. They could care less about what the underlying tensions were that, that gave rise to that response. All they're concerned about is a negative response. So they won't even it, you know, admit that argument. Their, their argument is going to be the result versus the, the underlying um, call, what caused that, that, that response, that action. And arguably, you, you, it's just not that simple. You can't say rioting is wrong unless you understand is it wrong well morally maybe so maybe not but that cannot be separated from why you rioted in the first place and anyone who yeah. tends to separate those two is is not willing to understand the argument from both sides period dot in it's My, not black and white. No, no. no go ahead bro you can finish no, i'm good okay so so part, part of my frustration also has been the, the subtle narratives that have been spoken via um, the news outlets. I was watching CNN mm. the other day mm. and they were showing mm. the looting and they, I want to say it was in a theater or some high-end store. People are looting, running in and out in this, this Caucasian sister is walking out bags, clothes, and she's walking by herself and the anchor says she's probably an employee trying uh, to save some no of the employees. And I said, wow. 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 I, I was mind blown. And I actually, I said, did you catch that? And it's just like those subtle little um, hints to, to who we are, um, the, the reason behind the looting. It's just, Oh, everybody's doing it, but the the whites are doing it to save the store because they probably work there. So it, it w once I heard that, I said, okay, well, th there's there's probably um, I mean, I hope she was reprimanded, but uh, there there's this continued subtle nar narrative if we don't listen that uh, continues to be spoken in in the mouths of those who can't understand, can't empathize, and just really don't want to empathize or care. It's just, hey, I'm here to report. So that's all I'm going to do. And yeah. I was telling Pastor the other day, I, I watch Fox News, and they, uh, they're they different uh, how they approached it. Instead of saying eight and a half, almost nine minutes, and they, they reported several. So they, they would not put 
a name to it. And, and, and instead of, they, the story was about six minutes long. They spent the first minute, minute and a half, really just talking about the incident itself. Where it, and they were very, um, very non-emotional, very, you know, as a matter of fact. But the last, you know, 70% of the interview or the piece was about the negative impacts of the riot, not what gave rose to it. So same reporting, same, it's just such a different slant. This happened, we were not gonna stick on it, we're, we're in, but the result, let's talk about the negative responses as a result of this versus the act itself. It's like they set up the act as only a, here we go again, uh, here's here's another excuse for um, uh, for them to tear up America. And that's what the the overall tone of that piece was. I, I th are you kidding me? Yeah, and you know the notion that I mean, I guess I I'm I'm not I'm not for rioting. I'm not I'm not pro rioting. Um, I'm not you know suggesting that like hey you should go out here and burn something or loot and and all those things. Um, yeah, I'm not. I, I I'd be a fool if I don't recognize right that that some people respond to the carrot, other people respond to the stick, um, and that some of this happens mm, because good. you have good. a entire society that is looking and waiting to see when it when it is that you will move, when it is that you will uh, um, uh, start to adjust because there have been things that have been wrong. I mean, it's no different than a child that cries out. What happens when they don't, when they, when they reach and they don't get something the first time, they cry louder and they cry louder and they cry louder. And eventually you see, you know, a, a tantrum because they don't get what it is that they're trying to bring attention to. Um, and not calling these people children by any stretch of the imagination, but I think that's just human nature. It's like, look, at some point you've got to hear me. Um, and I mean, the, the, the notion that somehow um, one that, it, that the most people are looting is false, right? Like that's not the case. Most people aren't looting. Most people are doing peaceful protests, but you do yes. have a number of people in the, I mean, I think context is everything. You're in the middle of a pandemic. You're in the middle of a pandemic with, um, catastrophic, uh, economic, uh, situations going on. Some of these people are breaking into these targets and taking stuff. Because they actually need things. You know what I mean? Like, they're yeah. disenfranchised communities that have been struggling. That $1,200 got spent up a long time ago. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, you're in, you're in neighborhoods and we talk about, oh, well, they're going to give them the unemployment checks. Well, what if you ever had a job to start with? You don't get the unemployment check because you don't have anything to draw from. You know what I mean? So some of this is people that just need basic needs and basic things they're trying to get. And I mean, I think we've got to have a more intelligent conversation about, about looting. And the last part of this is, I don't know kind of where you guys fall on this, is one of the things that really, really stuck out to me in that video uh, for George Floyd was uh, the, the the black guy who was arguing like, hey, you're killing him. Like, you know, you could see he wanted to engage. He wanted to do something. And mm. I really, really identify with him like, mm. I have physical strength to change this, but I don't have the authority and the space to change this, right? Like, as a black man, I know that like I can physically go in here and push this guy off. But I'm probably going to die. He's still going to die too, right? So it's going to be for net gain. I'm just going to have lost my life for nothing. Um, but like that sense of feeling like you are being forced to be in your place. You're being forced to watch somebody else get killed. That that helplessness. And so you can't help but think, if I felt that way, what is it that I'm going to instinctively want to do? Well, I'm going to want to cast off all types of restraints. I don't want anybody ever to put their finger down on me. I don't want anybody to tell me what I can and cannot do. So I can't go in the store. I'm going to go. I can't take that. I'm going to take it. It's a humanistic response. And I mean, we want to demonize people for, for, for carrying out their most basic human instincts. I mean, but without looking at all the factors that sort of kind of led us here. I, I agree. Because the thing is, this, for, again, I'm not a proponent of rioting or looting, but I'm not mad at it either because I understand it's an outcropping of our emotions. Um, and then the, the other, here's the other side. Some impact is only felt when it hits the pocketbooks, when it hits the purse of America, then they will start to say, Okay, maybe we need to make some changes. The the whole 
um, Blackout Tuesday was not just about not getting on social media, but it really was the beginning. It, it's, its origins were really founded in the concept of not spending the black dollar that black people spend, I think is somewhere up like a, a billion dollars a day or something. I mean, whatever the number is, is hot. Is it one or is it one billion or ten billion dollars over the course of a day nationwide? If we take that money and every day we go, we're not spending that money. Once a month, we say we're not giving y'all that money. That's going to impact the GDP. Is going to impact um, businesses around the country. When we all say, you know what? Today you're not getting my money. Today. You know, I'm not going to Chick-fil-A. I'm not ordering anything on Amazon. I'm not, you know, um, giving to any any business that is not black owned. I'm not giving that money. That would ultimately impact society and make them take notice. Because honestly, if y'all know these these statistics, black people spend more money per capita than any other nationality in America. That that, that we 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 are commerce to a large degree. So when you see looting. When you see rioting, we, we're saying, hey, they're, they're, I'm saying we, but they're saying, those looters are saying, hey, I'm going to take this and what you won't get in exchange for it is my money. And ultimately, um, if we take everything out of a store, I, I saw one of those Target stores, that thing was down to the studs, basically. They took wow. everything. People were walking. Um, so I saw a, a, a somebody riding on a train that was in, in one of the malls. Literally just driving the train down the street, <laughs> you know. Those are the things that we do. You know, we are we are a creative force. So those are the things that we do. But I I think part of this is is also to to show the other side that hey, listen, we are people. We we are we are not just dollars for your store. We are people. We we are not just um, those those kind over there. We're people, and I think um, ultimately that this is is going to get the attention that it needs to get because of how long. I mean, the, the riots and the protests—they going way longer than they had before. We are we at a week already with no end in sight, um, and we, we know we're making a difference for two reasons: um, the response from the White House. You know, you're making a difference when the White House. Is 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 when the, when they ramp up their rhetoric, you know, talking about mobilizing the the, um, the military and all of that, which is not legal, and I'm not sure that it would happen um, without the support of the governors. Um, but the mobilization of the military and then the distractions. Every time something ramps up, there's a distraction on their side. That's to me. That's one of the the, the indicators that we're actually making a difference. That the 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 people who are on social media speaking. The people who are on the streets who are protesting, and even when it boils over and you get into the rioting and the looting, it's making an impact. And my hope and my prayer is that um, eventually we we'll get to the point where the nation will recognize the malady called racism for what it is. This is not just a one-off. This is something that is again institutionalized. It's systemic. It's it's a part of what we've been dealing with on a daily basis since 1619, and we're we're past 400 years now. We we you know the the, the prophetic 400 years that's over. We we're in a, a different time, a different age, and I think that's the other thing that you we we live in a woke, a very very woke society, and nobody's letting it slide anymore. Nobody is is okay with Amy Cooper calling the cops because mm. a black man wants her to put her dog on the leash, you know, and, and the, the, that's the other, the, the other side of the, of the coin. And we honestly don't have enough time to really dig into this today, but it's, it's something that I think we need to be at least spoken of is that we're, we're also targeted just for being black. You know, I saw um, a post young lady sitting, sitting on the side of her building she just decided to go instead of staying in her apartment. She came down and sat on the side of her building, and a white lady called the cops. Said this young lady is bothering me. She's threatening me and my kids. The kids were nowhere near. It was just a lady by herself, and the girl had the video, literally just recording her. And they lie. I, one of the things I hope happens out of this is 
that they um, that the government, especially if when, when the regime win, please Lord, when the regime changes, go out and vote today. You suppose you should be voting when the regime yeah. changes. Um, that they institute some laws that make it illegal to make false reports because those false reports are, are putting our lives at risk because we don't we're not given the benefit of the doubt. You know what I'm no. saying? So. Mm. I know we we, we got to we gotta get out of here and talk for another three or four minutes. Um, but any closing remarks, any things that you guys want to say before we end? Go ahead, Twa. Uh, I wanted to say just two quick things. One, um, you you mentioned the part about um, um, uh, our, our dollar being, you know, the, the force that we need to use. And I mean, you name companies like Amazon and Chick-fil-A and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an avid shopper at both. Um, and I think the point has to be said that this isn't about just companies that, that are, you know, racist or is an indictment on any, you know, any company or franchise that they have, you know, not um, necessarily been favorable to black folks. This is about us controlling our dollar in a way that it forces those companies, even companies that we like and even companies that we feel like we have um, um, akin values with, that we force them to say, you know what, you've got to get off the sidelines too. You've got to come to the fight just like we come to the fight. And so for every company that I'm going to spend my dollar with, it's not just about you not opposing me, it's about you supporting me. Um, and the, 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 the last thing that I'll say is that um, as you were speaking about you know, this fight against racism, um, and about you know, the things being kind of at the speed pitch right now. Um, sort of kind of to, to hit the nail on the head and, and, and pun is included here. I think that as we are now engaged in race, engaged in this fight against racism um, and that everybody has um, eyes on it and everybody can see it, we've got to be just like that cop. We've got to keep our, our foot, our knee on the neck of racism, not only till it dies, but till literally we see all of the life come out of it. Like that's our charge, that we keep at it, that we that we don't let up until literally there is no chance of it living again. Agree, Chuck. Um, just to piggyback off of what you said, uh, I want my my last thing is I pray just as we are, as you mentioned, Bishop, getting the attention of those who um, are in power in our country that. Um, in this time, we give some attention to ourselves, to the black dollar, um, understanding that when this passed, um, no, nah, I don't need the Jordans. Maybe I need to invest in Nike. Maybe I need to buy some stock. Understanding the power of the black dollar and not just going back um, to, to the norm because uh, those who are in power are aware but now we have to be aware of the power that we possess, not only um, our voice, not only by means of protesting, but by means of making sure we're putting our money in places that will return um, a high dividend and cause us to be in spaces where we can have a legitimate seat at the table because our money is there. So that's my two cents. Bro. Yeah, the one thing I would leave is that um, th to make change, it's going to cost us something. Um, it's already cost us uh, a lot culturally, um, personally. Uh, there was this Bangladeshi store owner, and I forget what city he was in. I think it may have been, uh, I can't remember what store, but he had put on his store um, minority owned in hopes that it would prevent the rioters or, or the mob from but his store was gutted. He, he, he had significant loss. It was a sole source of his income for both him and his daughter. And he was talking to one of his relatives and his daughter heard him say, you know, I'm glad they burned it down if that helps. I'm glad that they gutted it if that helps. And his daughter could not understand why his, her dad would say such a thing. And he looked at his daughter and he said, look, I can rebuild. I can put everything that they tore all down off that shelf, I can put it back. You can never put that young man that died back to life again. And if 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 this causes us to make a dent in the national um, conversation, then I'd let them burn it again. It's that type of commitment, that type of willingness to sacrifice a cause that's bigger than you are. I think to me, 
that was a message that stood out. That video went viral. So it's going to cost us. We have to be willing to, like we each of us says, to get out of our comfort zone. Um, um, the demise of racism is going to cost, and that that's what's it. Everybody, every one of us need to get out and be willing to sacrifice and then give up the, those things in order that we put that knee right on the neck of racism. I agree 100%. Guys, thank you so much for um, sharing your heart, being honest, uh, being open, and um, allowing the world to get just a little piece of the space that you live in. And I hope um, that as Black men, we, are a, we were able to foster um, some conversations in the homes of some of our, our friends, our constituency, um, members of the church, and without um, to to really be honest, if if we don't speak our truth, if we don't articulate the space that we're in, um, there are some things that will never really manifest. Uh, and I believe that the church is one of the, is is one of the um, fulcrums uh, that that has to be utilized in order to really um, cause the pivot that we need in society, in culture, and ultimately uh, even in the political realm. So I'm I'm absolutely grateful that you guys join me today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for um, your, your intellect and, and sharing with us today. Everybody, thank you all for joining us today. It, um, I, I hope that this was uh, helpful. Um, I, I pray that you are praying for um, your friends, for your family, for those people who are connected to you um, and, and praying for this community and for this country. Uh, if we can't do anything as a church, one of the things that we can absolutely do is intercede uh, for those people um, who don't know how to connect to God uh, and cover them in prayer, believing that change is coming. I, and, and I don't even want to sing change gonna come. I want to believe that change is here and that this is the, the front side of uh, monumental change around this country. Uh, listen, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're going to sign off here, but uh, don't forget um, we're asking if you wouldn't mind to sow into this ministry. Uh, we believe that we're making an impact uh, in the community, in our city, in our state, and around the world. So into this ministry, um, the uh, you'll, you'll see the ways to give that are populated up on the screen uh, when we're done. I thank you for your support. Thank you for your prayers. Um, we are Black men. Um, our lives matter. And uh, we believe that justice will prevail. God is a God of justice. He's a God of judgment and a God of justice. And my prayer for each of us, uh, especially in the black community uh, and, and communities of color, is that justice would flow like a mighty stream in your house, in your community, in your life, and in your family. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you soon.